Welcome to the MIT D-Lab Practical Impact Alliance Participatory Design Online Course. My name is Kendra Leith, and I'm going to talk to you today about selecting an approach. When thinking about selecting the approach that you want to use for participatory design, there are a number of things you should think about. Ultimately, you should think about what are your goals for your particular project. Are you trying to build the capacity of communities? Are you trying to get a very well-designed product that's going to meet the needs of end users? What are your key goals? So that's the first thing to start with. You then need to think about some other things as well. What is the technical nature of the product or program? If you're thinking about something that's really technical, like vaccines, it's likely to be much harder to engage solely end users in that design process to create a solution. You might need to develop capacity or bring in outside experts through a user-centered or a co-design approach in order to be able to address some of those particular challenges. You also need to think about the time to participate. User-centered design might require a few hours, whereas co-design and user-created design can take much longer. Co-design might take weeks, whereas user-created design might be more like days. So you need to think about, do these people have the ability to participate? Do they have the time to participate, particularly at a given time during the year? When thinking about whether you want people to have ownership over the product, ownership is likely to increase with co-design and even more so with user-created design. So that's something to think about as well. If you want to build the capacity of the participants to solve their own solutions, co-design and user-created design might be more appropriate as well. With all of these things, you need to think about language and translation issues. However, it may be more of a challenge with user-centered design or co-design if people are engaging in design teams where they're speaking different languages or coming from different backgrounds. This may be less of an issue with user-created design if the team speaks the same language. However, there can still be issues related to delivering curriculum and things like that. If you're looking for buy-in from a variety of stakeholders, it's potentially greater with user-centered design and co-design because you're engaging a variety of different people. In terms of resources, user-centered design might require a medium level of resources to engage people, user-created design a bit more, and co-design might require even more resources than that. So these are things to keep in mind as well. With all of these approaches, you need to think about intellectual property issues and how they're going to be addressed. What are the expectations? How is that going to be put in place? And then you also need to think about the group power dynamics. How are those groups going to interact? Even within a group where everyone's from the same community, there may be different power dynamics there as well. So you need to think about these different components. So we've highlighted here some key considerations for selecting an approach. These are some of the things that we have seen personally in D-Lab when applying these different types of approaches to our work. However, it really depends on how you implement a particular process. Depending on how you implement user-centered design, there may be, it may require more time, or maybe you have greater ownership, but it really depends on how those things are implemented. And so I just wanted to highlight here that these are some of the things we have seen when implementing these approaches in our work. So I just want to say thank you so much for coming by today. I want to remind you that we talked about our definition of participatory design, talked about some of the potential challenges and benefits, as, especially as documented in the literature, of using participatory design approaches. We also talked about a number of different examples of different types of participatory design. And then finally, we ended with talking about a number of key considerations or things to think about when selecting a particular participatory design approach.